That's what farm price supports and subsidies and monopolies do. So what we have is a system which all the rest of us are paying these higher prices, but there's no greater return on the investment for the people who hold them. We need to get some way to get out of that. Well, Tom, thank you very much for coming along and for volunteering to be uh, part of this uh, experiment in uh, public policy discussion. Thank you, everybody else uh, who's here to attend this. Uh, Tom, public choice economics, I, I guess there's, there's two reasons why we at the Foundation are, are interested. Uh, one is that we have a hunch that public choice perhaps tells us something uh, about why big government is not always such a good idea, uh, even if we have good intentions. And the second is that a lot of people here are involved uh, in practical politics as candidates and activists, uh, and they're interested in understanding the motivations that people have. Um, could you just tell us a bit about what is the, the essence of public choice economics, and, and what sort of beliefs did it disrupt when it emerged? Well, we can think about it actually starting with one of the first great political scientists, Aristotle. In his politics, he starts out with something that set the tone for political science for the next 2,000 or so years. And he says that we see that every city is some sort of partnership. And city in Greek, polis, that's where we get the term politics and political. And all partnerships aim at some good. And so the very beginning, it's about morality. It's about what is good government topic. But later, people like James Madison, the primary author of the American Constitution, said, as he put it very famously, enlightened statesmen are not always to be found. What we want is a set of rules that can survive bad politicians. Because we want to take people as they are, not as we idealize them to be, but people as they are. And public choice began by asking, when people go into the marketplace, economists, Adam Smith onward, understand their behavior. You go in, you want to get the best thing at the best price. It's going to satisfy you. You don't go into the grocery store saying, I want to better society. Just say, I want bread. I want good bread at a good price. When we go into the voting booth, the assumption was everyone goes into the voting booth only thinking about what's the best society not how can I get my share of the loot, how can I get my subsidy, how can I get my buddy elected. And public choice began to say, you know, it's the same people. Goes to the grocery in the morning and goes to the voting booth in the afternoon. What changed about them? Well, it turns out nothing. They're the same people. So we want to use the tools that we use to understand going into the marketplace to understand politics as well. It turns out it predicts political behavior much better than the assumption that all politicians are wise, enlightened, wonderful, uh, good, benevolent, and so on. Some of them are, but in fact, all the rest of them are just like the rest of us. And that's what, what public choice is looking at, politics for real people. And so if it's kind of the, the science of understanding uh, voter behavior, can we, can we talk a, bit, a little bit more about that? Uh, because you say that when you go to the grocery store and when you go to the polling booth, uh, you're the same person. But do political and private markets provide you with the same sort of incentives? No, very different. But, but let me give you one example, though, why that this understanding is really important uh, to understand political behavior. There was a puzzle for a long time. Why is it that, let's say, Belgium has this kind of wacky political system with 11 different parties and this and so on, and the United States or Britain or Canada tend to have revolving door systems of two-party system. And some people thought, well, it's because those continental Europeans are wild and tempestuous people. It might be true of the Italians, but not the Belgians. <laughs> that really doesn't explain why Belgium has this complicated political system. Anthony Downs, in his Economic Theory of Democracy, pointed out it's the voting rules, proportional representation, will get you a multi-party system because you can compete on the edges of the political ideology. But winner take all, first past the post, single member districts, which are more common in let's say United States or Great Britain, tend to generate parties that compete for what's called the median voter. Half are on one side, half are on the other. You have to assemble that coalition of 51%. If you get marginal parties at the edges, what they say in America is don't vote for the third party, you'll only elect the other guys. 
you'll waste your vote. And so that was a really profoundly uh, powerful explanation for why you get different kinds of political systems. Rules matter. Rules are really important. And the incentives that voters and politicians face will form their behavior. Prior explanations were all about national character and uh, something about the national spirit and so on. I would guarantee if you introduced the Belgian voting system th in the United States, there'd be seven parties in Congress next after the next election. That's what determines it, the rules. So if you look at the incentives that voters face and the incentives that you face in the marketplace, you go in to buy an automobile or some food, you bear the cost and you get the benefit. You're looking for ways to make sure that the benefit is greater than the cost to you, what you give up. But now you go into the voting booth and you say, well, I'd like to get that subsidy. You have very little incentive not to vote for it because if you get it, it comes to you, someone else is going to pay for it. right? Uh, when it comes to lobbying, everybody wants the subsidy at someone else's expense. If I don't lobby for the subsidy, what happens? Someone else gets it. right? So, of course, everyone says, well, I'm just getting back what I paid in and so on. And you have a, a drive for more government than people would have chosen if they had chosen under different choice rules. And that's what we have systematically all around, is more government than people, in a sense, want. I'll give you one simple example. In Slovakia, one of our think tank partners called Ines does a great project. You can go to it online. Type in price of the state and Slovakia on Google or Bing or whatever. They allow people to go online and buy their own government. How much would you like to spend on sports education? How much would you like to spend on uh, self-esteem counseling through the government ministry of self-esteem? How much would you like to spend on defense? How much on police? How much on all these different things? Then you check out. It's like going to an online store. And it says, congratulations, here's the government you bought. And it's this big. And then, surprise, here's the one you got. Yep. This is the real size yeah. of the government. Yeah. You were willing to pay for this much. This is what you got. And then it gives you a little bill, like you would get if you bought something in a store, that itemizes how much taxes you're going to pay for this government you actually got versus what you would have paid for the government you wanted. Yeah. That's a nice example of how our choices end up being reflected in very different outcomes depending on whether we're choosing in the market, voluntary exchange, or the ability that we have in politics to impose costs on other people. That's the real key difference. I guess if, if everyone else is going to do it anyway, and uh, the government you vote for is not necessarily the government you get, it, it does raise something of a paradox that you know, even in really bad turnouts, 35, 40 percent which in the U.S. Is, is maybe a couple of hundred million people uh, still bother to, to, to vote. And, and so, you know, what, why is it that people still do this thing uh, when it seems that the, the influence they can have is, is so minuscule? Well, it is an interesting issue. It's called the paradox of voting. What is the likelihood that my vote will decide the outcome of the election? It's, it's indistinguishable from zero. Right? You'd have to find an election that was decided by one vote. Right? And that, that happens occasionally, some dog catcher someplace. Yeah. But even uh -huh. Gore v versus Bush, it was 550 votes when they took the final tally in the state of Florida, which was razor thin, yeah. but not one vote. So then the question is, given that voting can be costly, you have to go there and wait in line and all that, why do people vote? And the reason, I think, and that public choice scholars have focused on is expressive voting. It's an inexpensive way for me to express my views about the world, how angry I am, or whatever it is. It's part of my achievement of my identity. People vote because they say, I'm that kind of person. I'm conservative, or I'm liberal, or I'm leftist, or I'm whatever it might happen to be. That's one of the reasons they vote. But it also generates some irrational outcomes from a, a public perspective. Because the cost of my voting is not that high, so it's, it's an afternoon and waiting in line and so on. But the consequences of my vote could be a catastrophe. I go into the voting booth saying I'm angry about some issue. Or let's take racist behavior. Most people in private behavior find it very costly to indulge an irrational prejudice against other people, right? Because 
it costs you something if you don't hire the best qualified person, if you don't buy the lowest priced product, you bear the cost. But I can go into the voting booth and say, I think all the Jews should be punished, or the blacks, or whatever group it happens to be I, I might not like. It costs me nothing to do that. And the consequence is you get a government intent on a destructive, monstrous policy that no voter would have been willing to bear alone. They wouldn't have been willing to go beat up some member of an ethnic group that they had some harbored some prejudice against. But it costs nothing to, in effect, get the government to beat them up. And here's the added bonus for hateful people. The people get beaten up have to pay the taxes to be beaten up. We call that socialization of the cost. So you can socialize the cost of hurting another group onto that group itself. Uh, in fact, if you look at a public choice analysis of the Third Reich, to take the really extreme, horrifying example, a very good book by Gertz Ali called, uh, came out a few years ago called Hitler's Volkstadt, uh, roughly means Hitler's people state. He says the, the Third Reich was a welfare state. If you don't understand that, you won't understand how it functioned. Hitler was able to finance giant expenditures on social benefits for what were called Volksgenossen, ethnic comrades, and they did it on the taxes on the Jews. First the 10% wealth tax, and Volksvermögen they called it, the people's treasury, then confiscation of the Jews, and then they looted all of Europe. Food, wine, everything of value sucked out of all of the occupied territories. That explains, and I think Gutz Ali having a public choice approach, the popularity of that horrifying regime all the way to the very end of the war. Because the reason was Hitler's supporters got stolen stuff from other people. And it turns out if you steal stuff from people and give it to your supporters, they'll like you. It's a bit like the farm price support system in America, only not uh, only far yeah. more malicious. Yeah. You can steal from other people, give to somebody, and they like you because of it. Yeah, th these are interesting examples. I mean, you talk about farm price support. Uh, we have something very similar in Canada called supply management, where uh, basically there are very high tariff walls around bringing in dairy, egg, and poultry to Canada. Um, in order to keep the prices high uh, within Canada, people mm -hmm. get supplementary prices uh, for what they produce. Uh, and the result is everyone wants to be one of these farmers, but the supply is limited. So you have a situation where you know it's twenty-five thousand uh, dollars to to have a license for a cow. It's almost seven thousand dollars an udder, um, and then you, uh, you know, you, and we have a very similar problem here. Uh, I I believe it's a problem uh, with our taxi industry, in that uh, the city of Calgary knows exactly how many taxis there should be. Uh, as it turns out, uh, if anyone is not aware of this, the answer is thirteen hundred and ninety-six. Um, and that answer has been the same every year uh, since 1986. It's just that is the correct number, um, if anyone was not aware. Uh, and, you know, nobody supports this. The Calgary Herald editorial board is vociferous. The rest of the media is against it. Um, most of our elected representatives are, you know, so-so about it. Public opinion is probably 90-10 in favor of opening up this monopoly. Uh, and yet it persists year after year after year. Uh, and it's difficult to understand why this is, but perhaps it's a public choice. Oh, I think public uh, yeah. choice explains this to a T. What we have is what's called concentrated benefits and diffused costs. So let's take the case of uh, restrictions and importation of eggs, right? Because you can't have a little chicken in Minnesota laying an egg that's going to sit on a Canadian plate. That's an insult to the national honor. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and the same thing, by the yeah, way. An American that gets it. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> the same thing in America. They keep out perfectly fine Mexican tomatoes because of small numbers of tomato farmers in Florida. Uh, or, here's one of the worst, Americans pay the highest price in the world for sugar. When I say Americans, I mean U.S. Americans. Uh, they pay the highest price in the world for sugar to benefit small numbers of cane sugar farmers in Florida and Louisiana and people who grow sugar beets, which is the dumbest way to produce sugar <laughs> ever discovered, <laughs> um, as opposed to cane sugar. You can't import it from Brazil or the Caribbean. Why is this? Well, it's because every time I put sugar in my coffee, it costs me another penny or less. This is nothing, right? But add up everyone, every time they have a cup of coffee, take a penny and put it in a pot. Pretty soon, that's a lot of pennies. 
I think there's still a hundred and a dollar. So you can add that up. That's a lot of money. Somebody is very interested in getting that money, that differential between the market price and this restricted price. They come to Washington and they lobby. But no one goes to Washington to lobby for free market sugar prices. You can imagine a huge rally down Pennsylvania <laughs> Avenue, free the sugar. <laughs> um, it's not going to happen. It does have a negative impact, which did help Canada a little bit. Uh, it turns out that this almost destroyed the American candy industry. As we found, it was really a surprise, sugar is a major ingredient of candy. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? And one of the consequences was this ingredient went up in price, so a lot of candy factories closed up, and candy factories were open in Canada. So the little lifesaver candy, which was this thing that people in the U.S. took as a great American candy, is now manufactured in Canada. Canadians are smuggling sugar into the United States in this disguised as candy. <laughs> <laughs> effectively what happened. So it yields all kinds of weird knock-on effects that are harmful to other industries like the candy industry. But here's the even worse part of it. It's not even good from the perspective of those sugar farmers anymore. Because the rents are what we, it's dissipated. Once, and you gave the examples of taxi medallions and so on, once a subsidy or a monopoly or oligopolistic position restricted the market, you benefit someone. So I give it to you. I said, David, you're the only talk show host here in Calgary. You're the only one who has that right, but you could sell it to someone else, like you could a farm or, or a taxi medallion. You're going to get the full benefit. Someone else comes along and buys it from you later, the sale price incorporates the value of your monopoly. So the price that they pay yields no greater return on investment than any other investment in the economy, right? Because rates of return tend to equalize across different kinds of investments, something we know from economics. Mm -hmm. Now let's apply it to, to the economics of politics. That taxi medallion, New York, the right to drive a taxi, goes for more than a seat in the New York Stock Exchange, at least it did for years. I don't know exactly what those prices are today. It's a staggering amount of money. What are you buying? You're buying the right to receive that higher price. But you already paid that. The one who benefited from it died in 1954. He's dead, right? He got the money from it, sold it on, and then subsequent buyers paid for that monopoly privilege. That's what farm price supports and subsidies and monopolies do. So what we have is a system which all the rest of us are paying these higher prices, but there's no greater return on the investment for the people who hold them. We need to get some way to get out of that. Buy them off. Find some way to say you're not going to have the subsidy anymore, but politically you have to deal with the fact the, what was it, 1,396 of these guys? Right? I, I'm pretty sure. I mean, if I've misinformed you, I'm sorry, but, but there is a number. Yeah. I think it was 1,397. Yep. I checked. Oh, but, sorry. Uh, you always does his research. You know. Those guys and gals, yeah. they're going to be at City Hall. Mm -hmm. But taxi riders, right, they don't know who, the, who they are. All the taxi drivers know each other. They have low transactions costs. They organize, they get together, they have the Calgary Taxi Association. They meet. And they know how the thing works. But imagine you put up a sign that said, Association of Calgary Taxi Riders, come to the public meeting. <laughs> Who's going to show up? Nobody will come. In fact, this issue of what we call rational ignorance, the likelihood that I would benefit because I show up and become part of a winning coalition is undoubtedly the actual value of that is less than the cost of merely becoming informed about it. So to go back to the sugar subsidy. Take a public opinion poll in the United States. How many people know about the sugar uh, quota policy that keeps out that wicked Brazilian uh, cane sugar, which isn't really sweet like American sugar? <laughs> uh, how many people know about it? I'd be surprised if one in 10,000 knew it exists. It's not even worth becoming informed about it. But every sugar beet farmer knows about it. So, um, you, you know, here's the thing. This is starting to become a, a little bit dismal sounding. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I should have, I, I didn't tell you actually, the Manning Foundation, um, our, our full name is the Manning Foundation for Democratic uh, I Education. 
Um, but, you know, if we take public choice at face value, then the, the news for democracy is not good. First of all, uh, rational voters, by and large, ignore politics. Um, when they do bother to vote, uh, they find it costless to vote for very harmful policies, sometimes extremely harmful, um, but oftentimes just, you know, getting rid of sugar or at least making it more expensive than it should be. Uh, and then, of course, there are some people who do get more involved in politics than others, but only for uh, very uh, selfish and, um, I guess, uh, you know, undesirable reasons like stopping people from getting sugar in taxis. Um, how is it possible uh, to be a, a Democrat uh, and yet understand public choice? Is it that we're actually have a case for rejecting democracy here, or is it that uh, we need to rethink the, the rules of democracy? Well, uh, Churchill was famous for saying something that actually other people were also famous for saying, but uh, this one was that democracy was the worst form of government except for all the others. And there's a lot of wisdom to that. There's no other option that's better than some kind of democratic governance. But the key is constitutional democracy, not unlimited, a plebiscitary democracy. We should all have a vote on everything. Some things are matters of public choice. There are public policy issues that affect us all, and we want those to be on the table. Others should be taken off the table and protected as individual rights. And, th and that's where constitutions play such an important role. We don't get to have a vote and say, from now on, uh, everyone will have to go to my church. Right? Lots of countries have had those votes, those kinds of contests, and you end up with wars of religion. We'll have a big vote. We're going to have a state religion. Everyone has to be a member, and anyone dis who dissents is burned alive. So let's start. So we could say how many Catholics, how many Lutherans, how many Jews, how many Muslims, and so on. And then the majority wins, and all the rest of you come along, or we burn you. Uh, that's one kind of public choice. But those who understood the horrors of the wars of religion took religion off of the agenda of public choice. It was the first major privatized industry, if you want to think about it that way. You go to your church, someone else goes to their church, another person goes to the mosque, another person goes to a temple, or synagogue, and we can all live together happily. Voltaire described this beautifully in his letters on the English nation when he went to England and he witnessed the relative religious freedom that they had in England because it was a commercial and tolerant society as opposed to France where he had to struggle so hard for the rights of the persecuted minorities in France. Uh, so that's the first thing, is constitutional democracy, not just unlimited plebiscitary <coughs> democracy. We should limit the range of public choice of those things that are subject to actual public deliberation. All the rest, like what church you go to, how you run your business, your family, those are matters to be dealt with voluntarily, the church, family, civil society generally. Um, the other point, though, is, yes, it's a bit depressing when you think about these things and the incentives, but we have lots of examples of huge rollbacks of ballooning government power, and we should study those cases as well. You may have heard of a wonderful country called New Zealand. <laughs> uh, they kind of hit the wall with a whole series of bad policies, highly restricted economy, protectionism, uh, the agricultural sector was coddled in various ways. And for because of the wisdom of certain political leaders and the, the different events coming together, they were able to do something amazing in New Zealand. It's a wonderful example for the rest of the world to learn from, including stripping away the agricultural subsidies and protectionism, which hurt those farmers initially, all those benefits. You paid so much money, in effect, you're buying those subsidies and monopolies. They were taken away. But what happened? New Zealand started to really thrive. The agricultural sector took off because they were competing in the market. They were not competing for government's favors. And now, all around the world, New Zealand lamb, fresh fruit in the northern hemisphere, New Zealand fruit you can get on the ta tables in Toronto and Calgary. Uh, New Zealand wines that are really world-class wines, and that was because they were able to roll back this accretion of dumb policies and really launch New Zealand afresh. Canada had some similar experience with 
kind of hitting the wall in the 90s in a lot of ways. And because they had that, a lot of Canadians came forward and said, we need to make grown-up adult decisions. We can't afford this anymore. That's why I tell people in the U.S., look north. Mm -hmm. Look north to how to do these things. 